XX Alpha Moon X. You get a shout out for being the first to comment. So good to see you. We'll wait for a couple others to join and then we'll get started with our topic today about why patients lie, especially before surgery, and how it can often lead to all sorts of problems. But more importantly, why is there so much distrust for our patients in the first place? So we'll wait for the next person to comment to get a shout out and then we'll start. So far, it's just XX Alpha Moon. XX Alpha Moon. Heidi, good to see you. <laughs> All right. And oh, a whole bunch of people. Stacy, good to see you. And holy cats. Excellent. So I'm Dr. Anthony Cave, and I'm here in a real life operating room to share with you why some patients are dishonest with their doctors and why, how it's different between different generations, especially millennials, of which there are many, and boomers, which there are many. And most importantly, to be a good doctor, you have to be a good detective. Because when there is dishonesty from patients, it can be harmful to patients, especially in the operating room. It might lead to panic attacks, worse pain after you wake up from surgery on this table here in this unfamiliar environment. The less trust there is, there can be all sorts of consequences. And <laughs> sorry, life of a doctor, you always get phone calls like that. But like I was saying, the less trust there is from your healer, the less likely you are to be able to be healed. So, um, sorry, that, that phone call totally threw me off <laughs> when you're alive. All right. So the, you need trust, of course, in the person that you want to heal you if you want to be healed by them. And to be very clear, doctors need to earn the trust of their patients and patients also need to earn the trust from their doctors. Because when patients are not trusting their doctors, it's not because they're nefarious, um, they're lying on purpose. No, it's because there is shame, which is different than guilt. They're embarrassed. They feel like they're going to be judged. Have you ever felt these before? This can erode a relationship. It can lead to patients not being honest with their doctors. Hey, Dave H., thank you for that super thanks. So what do millennials fear about being judged over versus boomers? And what leads to that dishonesty? Because like I said, a doctor has to know so they can not judge, but be able to discern when something dishonest might be about so they can prevent something bad from happening, especially in the operating room. Well, first off, millennials tend to be more concerned about their exercise. Why? Because we believe in the 80s when they were growing up is when gyms blew up and they were so popular that when they feel like they're not exercising, the 75 minutes of moderate activity a week that we recommend, or the 150 minutes of, uh, of moderate, sorry, versus 75 of intense, they're kind of afraid to say, oh, actually, I don't exercise as much as I should. So they overestimate their exercise. Boomers, on the other hand, are more likely to be dishonest about their diets. They didn't have the same exercise craze with gyms when they were growing up in the 60s, 70s. So a little bit of a different exposure there. Of course, this can have consequences if you're not honest with your doctor. But what else? Holistic therapies are usually more common in millennials because they've been exposed to integrative medicine, to all sorts of supplements. Gosh, a common one I see nowadays is methylene blue. Not so much from the patients, but from their partners. The patients may never mention the supplements they're taking, but the partners will say that the toilet's always blue after the methylene blue. It's very hard to get it off of the ceramic. I'm not against supplements, and I support many of them when used responsibly. But uh, hey, Linda, thank you so much for that super thanks. Um, and FND is certainly a topic that needs to be addressed with trust from both the patient and physician. Good to see you on, Linda, and thank you for that super thanks again. Like I was saying, for supplements, though, boomers are just less exposed to supplements, with the exception of certain plants that we'll talk about. And Cindy, thank you so much for that super thanks as well. It's so kind of you. The supplements that millennials will take often are not reported to doctors because they're afraid that doctors are going to judge them. Why are you taking this fancy herb, this adaptogen? I don't know. Why are you taking, a common one I see is ashwagandha, a lot of rhodiola. Why? <laughs> and if these are missed, especially before surgery, they can have all sorts of consequences, especially on bleeding. 
How about boomers though? Let's go back to them. What do they underreport? I'll say in my experience, especially before surgery, boomers are going to not own up to how much substances they use in terms of rolling up joints and cannabis has a lot of powerful benefits, don't get me wrong, but I see a lot of recreational cannabis use that isn't disclosed to myself or nurses before surgery and I sometimes need to go digging around because it has consequences before surgery. Now once again, I'm not blaming patients. We have to understand why are they hesitant to share this with us in the first place. And boomers, oh, Carmelia, thank you for that super thanks as well. That's, uh, that's very kind of you. Well, Misty's asking a good question. What does it mean that Gen X wants more K? Well, Misty, that's a very good question. I don't think Gen X wants more ketamine than other generations. If anything, we know that Gen Z is very eager to expose their vulnerabilities around mental health. Actually, that's the next issue about millennials versus boomers. Millennials are very willing to disclose their concerns around their mental health. Boomers are as well, but boomers need to be comfortable with their doctors, as do millennials. But there's undoubtedly more recognition and we believe less stigma around mental health concerns that has helped millennials and in particular Gen Z, we won't talk about Gen Z today, to be comfortable sharing these concerns with their doctors. These have very big consequences, not only in the operating room, but even outside. It's a very good question about, uh, about ketamine there. But it doesn't end there. Gen Z is very cost conscious. So are boomers. Boomers may be on fixed incomes. But Gen, um, sorry, millennials, they like to ask for discounts. This has not only been my experience, they love to ask for discounts, especially in my clinic, but it seems to be that way for other physicians as well. And, and they're also very eager to shop around. They have all sorts of you know, digital literacy. Boomers do as well. And boomers will shop around for doctors. This is also seen in polls but they're less likely to ask for discounts despite being on fixed incomes. I think it's pretty interesting. Um, it doesn't necessarily lead to lies, but it's, uh, <laughs> I see others here are commenting on the discounts. But um, another big difference is that millennials are more comfortable with virtual visits and uh, telehealth. We know that patients over telehealth are less honest, partly because they're seeing new doctors constantly. There isn't a built up rapport, there's less trust. Of course, I understand if someone doesn't want to disclose to me all of their sexual activities and behaviors, all of their drug use, any history of opioid use or benzodiazepines out of concern for what goes in medical records for insurance reasons. Of course, I appreciate that because millennials are more likely to use those digital tools like telehealth. Those are more opportunities to be less honest than if you're in person the way that most boomers or more boomers like to uh, meet with their doctors. Now, a couple important things are that both millennials and boomers are going to not be honest if they disagree with their doctor's advice because most patients like to be polite in front of their doctors. Not all, I promise you, but most want to be polite. And uh, Sandra's asking why is this important? Sandra, uh, we're going to get there in just a moment because your honesty with your doctor has huge implications for your health. We'll get there in like one minute. Because <laughs> I need to just say that when patients disagree with their doctors, they're less likely to be honest about their concerns. They also, it's actually funny that young male doctors are the most likely doctors to be lied to, which is interesting because <laughs> I'm one right here. So let's get to Sandra's question specifically about why does this matter? Sandra, let's say you are coming to see me for acid reflux. Very common condition. It's one of the most, the medications prescribed for acid reflux, like omeprazole or famotidine, are among the most prescribed medications on the planet. Susan, thank you so much for that super thanks. It's very kind to you. Very kind. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. So let's say, Sandra, you're coming to me for acid reflux, and I ask you about what foods does it come after, do you drink alcohol? Does it come uh, after meals, when you lie flat? The common questions that you'll be asked. Well, if one was not honest about their alcohol intake, for example, we might start saying, well, gosh, your diet is okay. 
It's not related to food. I, we, we just have to put you on a medication to see what happens. But if it was disclosed that, oh, there's actually one, two, or three alcoholic drinks a day, we'd say, well, first, let's tone back the alcohol. That could absolutely reduce the acid reflux and might reduce the risk of ulcers potentially as well. And if that doesn't work, then we can go on medications. How about, Sandra, if somebody comes and they have insomnia, but they also have chronic pain, but they downplay their chronic pain because they don't want anyone to think that they're drug seeking. Hey, there's a lot of stigma around opioids. I have a whole video on the opioid pendulum that you should check out if hopefully it doesn't apply to you. But if someone is not being forthright about their opioid use, and then I'm giving suggestions about natural sleep aids. Well, if they're already taking oxycodone or narcos or something at home, and then I start to talk about how valerian root can be helpful with maybe L-theanine, maybe passion flower, et cetera, well, you're gonna now put together multiple sedating agents that I wasn't aware of. So we do have what's called a cures database where we can look at where patients are getting certain prescriptions filled and if they're getting chronic pain uh, prescriptions filled or if they're getting benzodiazepines filled. Hey, Gracie, thanks for that super thanks. I appreciate it as well. So that's another example, right? If we don't know what medications you're taking or how bad your chronic pain is, we're trying to give you medications to help with your sleep without addressing the root cause of why you might be having insomnia. E-M-S-R-N-B. I disagree about ketamine being terrible. Ketamine is appropriate in the right time and the right place for the right patient. Uh, can be very, very powerful. So another example, when someone comes to me and they are downplaying the fact that they had breakfast in the morning before surgery. Well, they don't want their surgery to be canceled. They don't have faith that the medical system is gonna be able to reschedule them again soon. So they say, oh, I didn't eat anything after midnight. I have not had breakfast. Well, I appreciate that you don't wanna get your surgery canceled. You don't wanna reschedule. It might not happen for another three months. You took time off of work to get here. I want my patients to know that I hear the amount of personal sacrifice it took for you. Time off from work, someone to pick you up. If you can trust that your doctor appreciates that type of hardship, I hope they can be honest about eating. Because if you don't tell us that you had breakfast, you could very well die if you aspirate or vomit up that breakfast when you're under anesthesia. So that's another example. How about patients that don't tell me about how bad their asthma is? So if they told me how bad their asthma was, I could have given them an inhaler before they go under anesthesia. And Heidi, thank you for that super thanks as well. Um, before anesthesia, there's a couple that are really important. Cannabis or marijuana use is so important before, to be honest. Everyone downplays it, it appears, but it has huge implications. Alcohol use, whether you ate, whether you have acid reflux, whether you have asthma, these are things that we can actively make changes about. And a very common one goes back to boomers. If you have trouble with physical activity, please tell your doctor before surgery. I've had a number of patients this year alone who were overestimating their exercise abilities. And then under anesthesia, it turns out that their heart couldn't handle the load from the stress of surgery. Well, that can end up as a heart attack. So when we say, when Sandra asks me, why does this matter? Your honesty with your doctor not only is helpful for you to heal, but also for your doctor to do right by you. Uh, I won't even mention medication. Well, I guess I should. Medication compliance is a huge one, meaning when we prescribe you medications and you don't take them, well, that can be a problem for many reasons. But big reason number one is that if one does not trust their doctor's advice, they won't take the medication. So if I prescribe a blood pressure medication for a patient and they think I'm wrong, which is okay to think that, it's good if we have a conversation about it, but if they don't take it, they come back, they say they're taking it and their blood pressure is still high, well then, we might prescribe a second blood pressure medication. Obviously, we hope that doesn't happen. But if they're not reporting that they're not taking their medications, which by the way, 50% of Americans appear to not be taking medications that they fill from the pharmacy. But you don't wanna look bad in front of your doctor, so you always say, I take all my medications on time, every day, doc. But when we don't get that information, that no, actually, we're missing doses every other day we might add more medications, more medications, more side effects. And if you know me, you know that I don't like polypharmacy. I don't like giving medications if they're not necessary. Natural therapies first, medications if needed, 
and the lowest possible safe doses. So if we are not taking your medications, do you think your doctor is being wrong about prescribing them? Please tell them and be honest instead of try to please them, which many patients like to do. Uh, hey, if you guys appreciate me coming on here after a long day in the operating room live for you all, I really appreciate you hitting the like button and sharing what you've learned with others so that you can help empower others in this case to be honest, not only with yourself about what you want, but also with your doctor so they can help you heal and so that you can find a doctor that's right to help you heal by being honest with them. If you don't know, if they don't know about you, it's hard for them to give you the right treatments that you deserve. I see it all the time in my practice. So please recognize that patients often will lie if they feel they're being difficult. They don't want to be difficult. They're, you know, I said earlier, shame versus guilt. They're, they feel shame that they didn't do something. Shame is, looking, is fear of looking bad in the eyes of others. Guilt is when we feel guilty and remorse for our actions and our own introspective view. So when you're shameful about what you did in front of doctors, it is best to change that around so it's not about being dishonest about the shame, but taking responsibility that, yeah, you know, I had the cake when I shouldn't have eaten the cake. Remember, that's boomers. They're not so honest about their diets. If you're the millennial and your exercising is not the way that you're telling your doctor, you know, it might be the difference between an ozempic prescription versus not getting an ozempic prescription. Very, very different paths based on what you tell us. And this one really hurts for me to, to share. So I hope that if this is you, you can grow out of this. But so many patients feel that when they are honest with their doctors, that they are not heard. 